Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. In the second lesson of week 11, we will discuss about education financing. Now, what I intend to do in today's class is to discuss a few arguments and debates surrounding uh, education financing. Uh, learners, you would recall that as a part of this course, we have uh, entered into various uh, discussions surrounding theoretical frameworks of education. We have discussed about how education uh, needs to be uh, provisioned. Uh, whether uh, how basic education needs to be provisioned, how higher education needs to be provisioned. We have also had elaborate discussions around private good and public good characteristics of education. We have seen that when there are uh, characteristics of joint consumption with respect to education, there are uh, disproportionate social benefits as a result of which we have seen that governments play an important role in provisioning of education. Now, the fact that governments play an important role in provisioning of education, budgetary processes uh, comes in in a very big way as far as funding for education is concerned or financing for education is concerned. In federal states such as India where uh, state and central governments play important roles in provisioning of education, therefore state and central budgetary processes becomes integral to education financing. Since the state and central budgetary processes are a larger part of the parliamentary processes or state legislative assembly processes in India, it will be difficult for us to look at the allocation of funds that takes place year after year because these are uh, dynamic estimates. Uh, there, there is a possibility to be able to do it, but as a part of uh, the economics of education and health uh, uh, financing in the context of uh, theories and applications, uh, it will be best to look at some of the dominant schools of thought in the uh, areas of health and labor economics that informs us about what are the different stances that different schools of thought have taken with respect to education financing. So, in today's class, I want to focus on some of the important uh, discussions from different schools of thought regarding who uh, benefits from education and who should pay for education in the larger context of education financing. Also because uh, we are uh, slowly inching towards the uh, SDG 2030 agenda and many countries seem to be uh, missing the SDG uh, bus on various uh, uh, outcome indicators, we will also look what is the UN model of education financing and what is the United Nations calling for with respect to meeting the SDG agenda. Many of you would know that SDG 4 focuses on quality education and lifelong uh, learning. So, education financing is an important part of SDG 4. So, we will look at what is the uh, UN model of education financing uh, towards meeting SDG 4 agenda and then we will see what are the shortcomings that countries such as India have to face given this framework that has been provided by the UN with respect to education financing. So, this is the outline that I have prepared for today's course. First, we will understand um, this issue of who benefits from education and who pays. We have of course dealt with this question in uh, many ways when we studied about education uh, policy, when we studied about uh, equity issues in education, we studied about inequality of opportunities, we have studied about intergenerational um, distribution of benefits from education. Uh, while we discuss the issue of higher education, whether it is a public good, private good or a quasi public good also, we entered into some discussion on who benefits from education and who pays. But still, uh, because we are discussing about education financing, it is useful to again begin with this question of who benefits and who pays. Uh, in this context, larger context of uh, uh, who pays for education, we will understand the role of public authorities in education financing. Uh, post that, we will look at some of the, as I said, dominant frameworks that have informed what kind of education financing policy needs to be pursued in the modern welfare states. There are two important uh, frameworks, so to say. One is the screening model of higher education and the other is the human capital approach, which all of you are very familiar with. So, we will look at the differences between the screening model of higher education which uh, informs us about how education financing should take place versus the human capital approach and we will see what are their implications in education financing. Now, in the larger context of human capital approach, there is also a discussion with respect to the Marxist approach of uh, education financing. 
Uh, to be able to distinguish between these two uh, approaches, I will highlight some of the important differences with regard to the state's role uh, coming from a, a Marxist understanding of uh, what is the role of education financing in a, uh, in a modern welfare state versus the human capital approach. Then we will look at the heterodox economics approach versus the human capital approach because all of these approaches uh, also have important implications in education financing. And as I just mentioned, we will end with the SDG 4 and the UN model of financing education. So let us begin with this question of who benefits from education and who should pay. Now you know by now that as economists we uh, tend to argue about where exactly is the frontier between education as a public good and a private good and we tend to generally regard education as some form of a quasi public good. Normally therefore we conclude that education is a public good when its effects are consumed collectively by the society and a private good when it directly benefits an individual. And therefore it is also fairly widely agreed that um, governments uh, have an important uh, uh, feature or attribute as a developer and equalizer of education opportunities and in financing and allocating public money therefore governments have to strive to provide those services that are in the public interest in economic terms so as to achieve the highest social benefit. Now what has happened over the period of last uh, few decades is that the cost of education has progressively increased from level to level and on the supply side supplying of education services the state basically needs to guarantee basic education for all children. We have studied about the probe reports, we have studied about the ASAR findings uh, on uh, learning crisis in the context of India and we have also discussed about right to education and what we realized is that as far as basic education is concerned, the social benefits that we derive out of basic education is so high that uh, the states need to guarantee basic education for all children of the respective age groups. And uh, we have also seen that in the developed countries, the Western European countries and so on, uh, where uh, the state's role in provision of basic education has always been very high as compared to the developing countries. Now on the supply side therefore the states need to guarantee basic education for all children and at the same time the state has to regulate student flows and limit the demand for and access to upper levels of education in particular higher education because it is not necessary that everybody moves towards higher education. Every uh, levels of education has its own uh, goals and responsibilities and therefore the state has to play an important role in regulation of demand for higher education as well. But no government at the present is in a position to provide higher education to all graduates of secondary schools and to meet the demand for university degrees. Uh, the higher the level of education of an individual, in particular if it is a university degree or PhD, the better are the prospects of their upward mobility in the labor market, remuneration and social benefits. In fact, in the earlier classes when we were discussing about the theories, we have seen that the pursuit of higher education or the achievement of higher education leads to not just individual returns in the present generation, but it has uh, higher returns for the uh, future generations as well. So, there is intergenerational uh, benefits uh, to higher education. So, it is concluded from many studies in many countries that private returns to higher education are way higher than those to basic education. So, then this is again uh, now at the center of this discussion about who should pay for education. If the returns to higher education uh, the individual or the private returns to higher education are way higher than the social returns to education, then is it the individual that needs to uh, pay more for their own higher education or the state should step in for uh, subsidizing higher education as well is a very important question that is dealt with in various country contexts. Now since the 1980s, policy makers in different parts of the world have uh, increasingly uh, recognized that the traditional methods of educational finance and management are unable to deliver even quality basic education to all children and therefore radical changes are needed. So we see a trend in financing of uh, the costs of higher education from the 1970s, uh, 80s and up till the 1990s and the 2000s. 
The trends tell us that in the 1960s and 1970s, the share of taxpayers, that is the government budget was increasing, while in the 1980s and 90s, we saw a slow shift towards financing by students or parents tuitions and user fees with the help of tuitions and user fees and other non-governmental sources for example industry, commerce, uh, donors accompanied by the reduction in the share of public funds for this level of education. Uh, developing countries such as India has particularly seen a drastic reduction in the uh, or drop in the share of uh, public provisioning of education in the 1990s and the 2000s. So, what we have discussed so far is that within the larger context of the nature of education as a public good or a private good, the discussion surrounding financing is important depending upon what kind of a good education is and we have seen that over a period of last few years, uh, there is a movement towards more of privatization of education. So, which means that funding of education uh, whether it is basic education or whether it is higher education is mostly out of pocket as far as individuals are concerned and also in terms of uh, the supply side provisioning of education also there is a move towards privatization of provisioning of education. So, it is in this context despite the fact that there is increased privatization or private funding of education, then we need to discuss what is the role of public authorities in educational uh, financing. Now, when we say the role of public authorities, we include uh, central, uh, regional and local public authorities uh, and uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that their role in educational financing remains significant even under conditions of decentralization and financial constraints. The regulation of educational supply and demand in the country, deciding on the balance between equity and efficiency of education, between uh, qualitative or quantitative aspects remains with the public authorities, in particular central ministries of education. So, uh, based upon this, we can identify and underline three functions which public authorities must perform in any context with regard to education finances. One is with regard to national education legislations or monitoring, evaluation and implementation of various kinds of policy frameworks. Second is provision of actual funds for education, whether it is in the form of direct and indirect subsidies to private, higher or continuing education or uh, in the form of uh, provisioning of uh, budget allocations to uh, various kinds of uh, education levels. And the third is management of education systems, which includes provisioning of adequate number of schools, uh, schooling infrastructure, uh, textbooks, materials, etc. So, these are the three core functions uh, we uh, need to identify and underline with respect to public authorities, which includes uh, central and state uh, departments, ministries, central ministries and the state governments, different departments of the state governments that have to play an important role in ensuring that these three functions are um, are delivered. So, the point is that given the larger context of who provides for education and who benefits for education, given the nature of education as a quasi public good, because there are characteristics of joint consumption as far as education is concerned, the role of government despite the fact that there is increased privatization or increased decentralization and financial constraints, the role of public authorities has to be center stage as far as the provisioning of these goods are concerned. Now, in the second part of this uh, lecture, we will focus on some of the dominant uh, thoughts or dominant frameworks that explain us or give us a view in the context of education economics with regard to how education needs to be financed. Now, you are all familiar with the human capital approach to understanding education, which provides us a balanced view with regard to uh, what is the purpose of education? Because education is viewed as uh, both a consumption good and a production uh, good in the context of uh, human capital approach and it enhances productivity of an individual and the human capital approach generally calls for the involvement of both public and private uh, uh, agencies for provisioning of good depending upon whether the publicness characteristic of the good is overwhelming in a certain context or the privateness characteristic of a good is overwhelming. So, for example, in the context of education or higher education that has more of uh, individual benefits than social benefits, the human capital approach would possibly ask for more of private financing of higher education. 
So, this is just to give you an introduction as to uh, what are the dominant frameworks informing us with regard to education financing. Let us begin with the first distinction that is of screening model of higher education versus the human capital theory and what are the implications for education financing. Now, first we need to understand what is the screening model. The screening model basically emphasizes the signaling function of education. Uh, here it means that education basically serves as some kind of a signal or a filter uh, for ability rather than a tool for skill enhancement. Its implications suggest more cautious public financing with a potential shift towards private investment. I will presently go to the distinctions of the uh, screening model and the human capital uh, model of financing a little more closely, but this is just to give you an introduction to what the screening model refers to. Similarly, human capital theory basically views education as an investment that enhances the individual's productivity and benefits a society. And this theory therefore supports broad public and private investment in education to maximize economic growth and social returns. But both models have distinct implications for how education should be financed and the role of policy in ensuring equitable and efficient outcomes for the society. Now, let us look at the distinctions in the core concept of the screening model and the human capital theory. Definition wise, the screening model basically says that education acts as a signal of an individual's innate abilities. So, for example, if an individual has been able to pursue higher education and sustain himself or herself in higher education and has been able to complete higher education, then there is an innate ability of an individual that she or he is available as an able person in the labor market. So, education acts as a signal of an individual's innate abilities and productivity to employers without paying heed to whether my higher education or whether my achievement of higher education has actually led to enhancement of my skills or not. So, it does not necessarily increase a person's productivity, but serves to sort individuals in the labor market. So, we are putting people into different buckets in the labor market that if a person has completed higher education or a technical education or a professional education from a certain uh, institution or has faced more uh, rigor in terms of education, then he or she is put in a different bucket as far as uh, their availability in the labor market is concerned compared to the rest. But in the context of human capital theory, education uh, is meant to enhance a person's skills and knowledge directly increasing their productivity. So, it is ensuring that one is not just pursuing education as a signaling uh, for labor market conditions, but as a, a enhancement of skills and knowledge which will directly increase my productivity in the job market that I am entering into. So, in that sense it is looked at as an investment that improves human capital necessarily focusing on the skill set that one is to develop or imbibe in the education sector. With respect to purpose of education screening model uh, tends to provide employers with a signal of potential productivity as I just mentioned, but not necessarily through skill acquisition. Human capital theory uh, strives to develop knowledge, skills and competencies that lead to higher productivity. With respect to role of employers, uh, the employers use educational attainment as a screening mechanism to infer a candidate's ability. Uh, but in the uh, from the point of view of human capital theory, employers expect that education directly improves a person's ability to perform in the workplace. So, for example, if we have MBA education or we have engineering education, so uh, following the human capital approach, an employer would like to see whether the skills developed as uh, from the education process is directly contributing to workplace productivity or not. But uh, comparing it with the screening model, the uh, mere uh, accumulation of higher education or acquisition of higher education, whether it is a professional education or not should suffice for the employer to infer a candidate's ability. With respect to value of education, uh, in the screening model value lies in education's role as a signal not necessarily in the skills or knowledge it imparts, but the human capital theory education adds value by increasing a person's productive capacity and efficiency. Now, with regard to motivation for individuals to pursue education, there are two uh, specific aspects with regard to the screening model and the human capital model. So, the primary reason for education according to the screening model is that uh, 
individuals pursue education to signal their ability to potential employers. So, those with higher innate ability are more likely to succeed in education, thus signaling their superior potential. But in the case of human capital theory, individuals pursue education because it enhances their skills, making them more productive, which leads to higher earnings. There is a cost benefit perception as far as motivation for individuals is concerned. In the screening model, education costs which includes tuition, the opportunity cost of time and so on are seen as a necessary expenditure to distinguish oneself in the labor market. But from the point of human capital theory, education is seen as an investment that will yield higher returns through improved productivity and higher wages. So, these are some of the minor differences between the screening model and the human capital theory. Now, of course, this has economic implications. There are three aspects that we need to look at uh, as far as economic implications of distinguishing screening model from human capital theory is concerned. One is education's impact on wages. Under the screening model, education serves as a signal for high productivity. So, therefore, it leads to higher wages even if that education does not improve skills. In the human capital theory, higher education directly leads to increased productivity which results in higher wages due to improved job performance. Returns to education. Now, this is where the screening model vis-a-vis -vis the human capital theory has huge implications for education financing. If education serves as a signaling process for employers, then we are not counting on social returns of education. My social returns could be low if education does not truly increase productivity, if it is being used only as a signaling mechanism, then we do not value social returns to education uh, as far as the screening model is concerned. But in the human capital theory, because the focus is on the actual increase of skills and productivity and because productivity of an individual and skills enhancement of an individual has larger repercussions for the productivity of the country as a whole or has uh, joint consumption characteristics in the case of uh, other individuals as well. So, then returns to education uh, includes both private and social returns to education in the context of human capital theory and they are high because it increases the skill level and overall productivity of the labor force. With respect to labor market efficiency, education uh, in the screening model enhances labor market efficiency by helping employers differentiate between high and low ability workers. So, somebody who has higher education or does not have higher education uh, may be put into the bucket of high and low ability workers. But in the context of human capital theory, education improves labor market efficiency by increasing the overall productivity of workers and matching them better to suitable jobs. So, irrespective of whether you have higher education access or not, if your skills are matching the ability uh, of the jobs, then you will be put into different buckets depending upon the skills that you, ha that you have acquired in the process of acquiring education. Now, all of these obviously has implications for education financing. There are four aspects that we can look at. First is public investment in education. As I have discussed in the beginning of the class, when we are looking at education financing, the role of public authorities become very important. But the role of public authority is very important given the quasi-public nature of the public goods nature of education. Now, in the context of uh, screening model, if education is primarily a signal, then large public investments may be less justified because social returns are lower in the signaling case. So, public funding cannot be more strategically allocated to areas where education enhances actual skills. Uh, but in the case of human capital theory, significant public investments are justified as education increases the human capital of individuals leading to economic growth and higher uh, societal productivity. In the case of subsidies and scholarships, if education serves mainly as a screening tool, government subsidies might benefit individuals more than society as a whole. So, financing should be cautious to avoid overinvestment in education that does not add to productivity. But in the human capital approach, subsidies and scholarships are effective in enhancing access to education, particularly for marginalized groups as they help individuals build productive skills that benefit society at large. Loans and private uh, financing, private financing is considered more appropriate if the private return outweighs the public return. So, loans can encourage more individual responsibility in education choices. 
But in the case of human capital theory, public and private financing should be structured to encourage broad access as productivity gains from education benefits both individuals and society through a more skilled workforce. In terms of equity consideration, if education is mainly a signaling mechanism, financing systems may perpetuate inequality by favoring those who can afford better signals, for example, elite institutions. Policy makers therefore may have to reconsider how to finance education to ensure fairness. But from the point of view of human capital theory, it supports broad equitable access to education as it directly increases skills and productivity, which can then help reduce income inequality and support inclusive growth. So these are a few critical differences uh, or aspects uh, based upon which we differentiate the implications for education financing following the signaling method of um, employment creation or education as employment creation and education as human capital theory, education being important in itself because it leads to various kinds of uh, uh, capabilities, uh, creation of capabilities. Now, of course, all of these discussions that we just had distinguishing the screening model with the human capital approach has policy considerations. Again, three aspects here with regard to education policy focus, screening model policies may focus on making education more efficient as a signaling mechanism, possibly through credential reforms or better labor market information systems to reduce reliance on education as the primary goal. Uh, a human capital theory policies emphasize expanding access to quality education to enhance skill development and productivity, ensuring that education leads to economic growth. Vocational training. In the context of the screening model, policy consideration is that there is more emphasis on alternative forms of certification or screening methods that reflect abilities directly such as vocational training or job specific credentials. Uh, governments invest in both formal education and vocational training to build a well-rounded workforce that meets market demands in the case of human capital approach. With respect to lifelong learning, screening model, lifelong learning may be viewed as less essential under the screening model as initial education is seen as the primary signal of ability. Uh, but in the case of human capital theory, lifelong learning becomes crucial to continue enhancing skills and keep up with the evolving demands of the labor market. So here, uh, this is one of the dominant uh, streams of thought in economics, uh, the signaling model of education and the human capital theory of education. What I tried to do in this part of the lecture is to distinguish between these two concepts by uh, bringing in the discussion of education financing because understanding the minute differences between these two models has huge implications for who finances for education, whether the state should step in or whether the individuals because they have more private returns to education signaling is providing private benefits to the individuals more than it provides social benefits then probably it should go for more of in there should be more of private financing or individual based financing of education. Now let us also uh, distinguish the human capital approach from the Marxist approach to understanding how education needs to be financed. Now Marxist approach basically advocates for full public funding of education and it views it as a right that should not be commodified. And the goal here is to democratize education to dismantle class structures. Uh, promoting equity and developing critical thinking that challenges the uh, onslaught of capitalism. In the human capital approach, it sees education as a public and private investment in human capital and it is very much a capitalist project and financing is often a shared responsibility between governments and individuals, governments for social returns and individuals for private returns. So the focus here is on enhancing productivity and aligning education with the market needs. It does not challenge the existing social um, hierarchies that are existing within a, a country. In essence, the Marxist approach views education financing through a lens of equity, class struggle and social transformation. But the human capital approach is primarily concerned with economic efficiency, productivity and uh, growth. So, there are a few uh, aspects that we can um, discuss in the context of distinguishing between the Marxist approach and the human capital approach, starting with the role of education. As we have seen education under the Marxist approach 
serves to reproduce capitalist relations and the critique from the Marxist approach is that the capitalist education serves to reproduce capitalist relations and reinforce class inequality. So, it is an instrument of ideological control. So, it is basically a critique on the human capital approach that the kind of education that is being created, it reproduces the capitalist relations and therefore, is can be used as an instrument of ideological control. But the human capital approach uh, in the context of role of education advocates that education is a means of increasing productivity and economic growth and therefore, it is an investment in human capital. The primary function of education, what is the primary function of education? Uh, the current kind of education that is being pursued uh, from the capitalist point of view, the Marxist approach critiques that uh, the current form of education perpetuates the class structures and prepares workers to fit into a capitalist system serving the interests of the ruling class. Uh, the human capital approach advocates that primary function of education is to develop skills, knowledge and abilities that enhance individual productivity and earning potential ultimately contributing to economic growth. So, the Marxist approach aspects that we are discussing here is basically a critique of the human capital approach from the Marxist point of view. Now, what is the view of public versus private uh, financing? Uh, Marxist approach advocates for public financing to make education a universal right ensuring equal access for all as opposed to commodifying education through privatization. The human capital approach supports a mix of public and private financing emphasizing individual investment in education as it yields private returns that is higher wages and social returns which is economic growth. With regard to focus on uh, equity, Marxist approach focuses on class struggles and views education financing as a means to address or perpetuate inequality and therefore it seeks to abolish class based education systems. But the human capital approach focuses on efficiency and economic growth with less emphasis on class inequality assuming that educational access will help individuals succeed based on merit and productivity. Now with respect to the role of state which is an important distinction. The Marxist approach advocates that the state should take a central role in fully financing and democratizing education, eliminating class based barriers and education should serve the collective good and not just private capital. In the human capital approach, the advocacy is that state should finance education to stimulate human capital development, but individuals are also expected to contribute through fees, loans or private investment based on the individual benefits they gain. With regard to education's relationship with the economy, uh, the Marxist approach uh, shows that education is linked to the needs of capital and serves the interest of employers in capitalist economies, reproducing labor power for the system. In the context of human capital approach, education is seen as a tool to enhance individual and societal economic potential and is directly linked to labor market demands and productivity. So, one of the reasons for introducing the uh, Marxist critique of the human capital approach and distinguishing uh, both these approaches on uh, these aspects of uh, education, the role of education primary function of education and the views of public versus private financing, focus on equity, role of state is to sort of try and understand the importance of uh, rights based uh, tools that have been uh, designed in the context of education or that is being debated in the context of health, what is the source from where most of these ideas are coming from and how the uh, different uh, state governments and central governments and different uh, ideas are being discussed in the context of what is the policy direction that should be given in the context of public policies on education or health and so on. Now, let us look at uh, uh, the heterodox economics views on education financing. Now, this is a new term for the students or the learners of this course of economics of health and education. In this uh, class, I want to introduce this new term called heterodox economics, which also requires uh, some understanding in the context of economics of uh, education. Now, very simplistically, heterodox economics encompasses a variety of schools of thought, which includes the Marxist, post-Keynesians, 
institutionalists, feminists and ecological economics, which all challenges the assumptions of neoclassical economics and emphasizes broader societal structure and power dynamics in understanding the role of education. In the earlier classes, I have provided some information about feminist economics and the understanding of feminist economics in the context of power and also in the context of uh, labor market and how their understanding has advanced the ideas of uh, the failures, some of the failures of the neoclassical economics and also uh, sort of advanced various kinds of ideas as to how labor markets function and how the understanding of role of power has entered into the demand for rights based uh, education or rights based uh, uh, development uh, in the context of health. So, the heterodox economics view on education financing basically emphasizes the role of education as a public good and that it should be universally accessible. You will find some similarity with the Marxist uh, critique of human capital approach that we just studied. So, emphasizes the role of education as a public good that should be universally accessible, equitably financed and free from market pressures. It uh, critiques the commodification of education and advocates for public financing models that prioritize equity, social justice and societal transformation. Unlike the human capital approach which focuses on individual returns and productivity, the heterodox perspectives view education as a tool for social change, fostering democracy, critical thinking and sustainability. So, in the context of education financing, heterodox economics tends to focus on issues of equity, social justice, power relations and the broader societal role of education beyond just market efficiency and human capital development. So, what are the key differences from the human capital approach? Let us discuss uh, in the context of the following aspect with respect to purpose of education. The heterodox economics view is that education is a public good and a means for social transformation. Human capital view is it is primarily an investment in human capital. Role of state, uh, heterodox economics views that state should play a strong role in fully financing education to ensure universal access and equity. Uh, the human capital approach supports uh, state involvement in education, but individuals also bear costs through loans, fees and private investment. Heterodox economics with respect to equity emphasizes on equity and social justice, ensuring marginalized groups receive adequate resources and access. Uh, the human capital approach focuses on individual returns and market driven uh, outcomes with some concern for social returns, but less emphasis on inequality. Critique of markets, uh, the heterodox economics uh, or economists are critical of market based solutions arguing that they intensify the inequalities of uh, commodifying education and education should be free from market pressures. Uh, the human capital approach supports market based solutions like tuition fees, student loans and sees education as investment. Education's role in society, heterodox economists view education should foster critical thinking, challenging oppressive structures and promoting social change. And with respect to the human capital approach, education is primarily about enhancing skills and productivity for labor market uh, needs. So, in this part of the second part of this lecture, we have compared uh, three important uh, or dominant uh, sort of uh, uh, streams of thought or schools of thought and we have compared it with the human capital approach. We began with the screening model which uh, entirely focuses on uh, private financing because uh, when education is used merely as a signal for the labor market, then the returns to education are mostly private than social. So, therefore, the screening model suggests for more private involvement as far as financing of education is concerned. Then we distinguish the human capital approach with the Marxist approach and the uh, heterodox economists view and we saw that all of uh, these views uh, um, talk about the role of the state, but the heterodox views including the Marxist uh, thought uh, talks about uh, uh, complete uh, uh, takeover of the state or more involvement of uh, public agencies or uh, fully financing education with the help of the state. Uh, the human capital approach on the contrary asks for a mixed kind of a model where there should be the presence of both public and uh, private sector. Now, we will move to the last part of the lecture where we will uh, talk about the uh, 
UN model of education financing because we are in the midst of uh, discussing sustainable development goals, the SDG agenda of 2030 and the SDG uh, goal 4 focuses on uh, quality education and lifelong learnings and education financing is an important component of SDG 4. So, we know that SDG 4 focuses on inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all. But in this context, let us understand the UN approach to education financing, particularly for developing countries. The first is the focus on global partnerships and collaborations. The UN basically advocates for all kinds of global partnerships to mobilize resources for education. And one of the key platforms through which it does is the global partnership for education, which brings together developing countries, donor agencies, international organizations, private sector and civil society to finance education. There is also an Education Cannot Wait Fund, which was established in 2016, which focuses on education in emergencies and crisis to ensure that children affected by conflict or natural disasters have access to education. With regard to targeted, various targeted investments uh, have been advocated to achieve SDG 4. The SDG 4 uh, aims to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education for all by 2030 and to achieve this, the UN emphasizes the need for increased public investments in education. So, you can see that the UN model of inclusive education or increasing uh, education access uh, takes a lot from the human capital approach of increased public investment in education, but also somewhere at the intersection of heterodox economists and human capital approach. The UN's approach encourages developing countries to allocate at least 4 to 6 percent of their GDP and 15 to 20 percent of total public expenditure to education, which is a target that is considered essential to improving educational outcomes. With respect to a focus on equity and inclusivity, the UN promotes equitable educational financing that prioritizes marginalized and vulnerable groups, including girls, rural populations, and children with disabilities. Equity based financing models encourage governments to allocate more resources to underserved communities to reduce disparities. So, you can see some of the important um, advocacies of the heterodox economics group informing the UN policy on uh, equity and inclusivity with respect to financing for education. UNESCO has developed the Education 2030 Framework for Action, which actually calls for countries to ensure that education financing policies are inclusive, focusing on the most disadvantaged populations. Uh, UN also focuses on blended financing and innovative funding mechanisms, so um, wherein it combines uh, advocates for combining of public funding, international aid and private sector involvement to meet the education financing needs of developing countries and this approach encourages domestic resource use alongside international aid. Innovative financing mechanisms such as results based financing or output based financing um, including impact bonds, they are increasingly being promoted by UN agencies as a way to attract private investments while ensuring education outcomes improve. Uh, for example, social impact bonds, they tie funding to specific education outcomes, incentivizing efficiency and performance. Um, output based uh, funding or output based investment is an important uh, policy initiative by various uh, international organizations with respect to donor funds being received by uh, different countries. Public-private partnerships are encouraged in a very big way to mobilize additional resources and enhance delivery of education and these partnerships involve collaboration between governments, NGOs, international organizations and private companies. Uh, UNICEF Global Education Program works with governments and private sector to ensure children, especially in low-income countries, have access to quality education. There is also a lot of uh, policy focus uh, on uh, international aid and donor support. UN calls for international aid for education, particularly for low income countries and a significant part of the financing comes from uh, official development assistance, which is critical for funding education programs in uh, countries that are struggling to uh, raise domestic resources for their uh, needs. Uh, there are various kinds of donor commitments for fragile uh, states that are facing humanitarian crisis. And the UNESCO International Commission on Futures of Education has highlighted the need for a coordinated international response to education uh, financing.
With respect to domestic resource mobilization, the UN emphasizes the importance of domestic resource mobilization. Uh, governments are encouraged to increase uh, tax revenue, uh, combat tax evasion and reduce debt burdens to free up more resources for education as well as health. Uh, there is an Addis Ababa Action Agenda 2015 which stressed the need for developing countries to build their capacity to finance education domestically through improved taxation systems and better governance. Uh, so, this is bringing in the efficiency characteristics of uh, uh, economics where the focus is on uh, the human capital approach but with equal emphasis on uh, financing by ensuring that efficiency of utilization of funds and creation of resources are uh, carried out. There is also a focus on capacity building and technical support. Uh, UN agencies particularly UNESCO and UNICEF provide technical support to developing countries in designing and implementing education financing policies and these include capacity building for governments to manage and allocate educational budgets. Uh, capacity building programs also uh, help countries strengthen their educational institutions, improving data collection for better policy making and ensuring transparency and accountability in spending. Uh, so, we can summarize the key principles for the UN model for education financing as follows. One is universal access ensures that all children regardless of background or economic status have access to quality education. Equity is an important criterion where there is a prioritization of funding for marginalized groups, particularly girl children and rural areas and uh, persons with disabilities. Public financing is an important uh, emphasis with regard to education financing, need for governments to allocate a significant proportion of their national budgets to education. Uh, innovative funding, uh, new financing mechanisms such as blended finance, public-private partnerships, social impact bonds and so on. And then there is a focus on results as I said output based funding or output based investments linking funding to outcomes and ensuring that resources lead to tangible improvements in the educational access and equity. Now, there are a few challenges in implementing the UN model in developing countries. Uh, and those challenges are mostly in the form of financial constraints. One is there is limited domestic resources. Many developing countries struggle with uh, limited tax revenues, high levels of debt and competing priorities. These are one of the reasons as to why meeting the SDG 2030 agenda also becomes a difficult task for many countries. There is a lot of dependency on aid. Some countries rely heavily on international aid which can be unpredictable and influenced by donor interests. Inequality despite efforts to promote equity, disparities in education access and quality remain significant in many developing countries and there is a lot of political instability in many countries, the conflict zones and they can undermine efforts to improve education financing and delivery. So, what we have done in today's lesson is to uh, cover the ideas on education financing in three parts. First is uh, we recalled our earlier discussions on uh, education as a public good or a private good or a quasi public good and we realize that uh, the uh, economic categorization of good itself has huge implications for uh, financing of education. So, we dealt with the question of who benefits from education and who pays for it and one of the uh, important things that we underlined is the role of public authorities in provisioning of basic education, uh, ensuring that uh, national legislations are carried out. Uh, ensuring that monitoring evaluation is carried out. Uh, similarly, we underlined the importance of allocation of funds by the central ministries and we also uh, focused on management of education systems as far as the role of public authorities is concerned. Uh, moving on, we then looked at dominant streams of thought with respect to education financing. We uh, looked at the screening model of education. Uh, we compared it with a human capital approach which is the most dominant framework as far as education economics is concerned. But within the larger uh, purview of education economics screening model is also an important model. So, we sort of tried and distinguished between these two and saw what are the implications for education financing. We brought in a discussion of the Marxist view versus human capital approach.
and then heterodox economics view versus the human capital approach. And then finally, we ended today's lecture by looking at the UN model of education financing and we saw that some of the best aspects of the Marxist approach or the heterodox economics approach and the human capital approach have been considered in uh, the uh, UN model of education financing with uh, equal focus on equity and uh, efficiency. We also saw that there are challenges in implementing the UN model given the structural characteristics of the developing countries which has slowed down the movement towards meeting the SDG 2030 agenda. So, I have referred to various writings on education financing by different scholars, uh, most particularly I focused on Gita Gandhi Kingdom, the private schooling phenomenon in India. Those of you who are interested can have a look at this paper which actually talks about the progress of private financing in schooling in India and what are the issues surrounding it. I have referred to a number of papers by Professor J.B.G. Tilak who has written extensively on financing of higher education in India right from the 1980s and the 1990s. Scholars who are interested to follow the issue of financing of higher education need to look up these reports and uh, articles by uh, J.B.G. Tilak uh, from uh, the 1980s and the 1990s up till the present period. And there is a lot of discussion on the economic categorization of higher education as a public good or a quasi public good and the implications it has for financing. I have also referred to a few books which has focused on financing of education systems and the role of public authorities and a few um, uh, UN information that I have collected from the UN websites on uh, transforming education and financing of education uh, policies. So, with this I end today's lesson on education financing. I will see you in the next class. Thank you.